Hi again, everybody. Let's see now if we can finish up with the budget set correspondence by showing that the correspondence is lower hemicontinuous. So our theorem here is actually going to require uh, a qualifying assumption up front, and that would be that the value of the consumer's initial bundle is positive. If that's the case, then the budget set correspondence is going to be lower hemicontinuous. And so let's go over here and let's remind ourselves what the budget set will be. It's the set of bundles in RL plus that satisfy the budget constraint, where X circle is the consumer's initial bundle, the bundle that the consumer owns of goods initially, and we say that the budget set correspondence, which goes from the unit simplex, let's say, into RL plus, is lower hemicontinuous at a particular price list P bar in the domain means that if the budget set there intersects with some open set in the target space, some open set V, whoops, that should be a V, not, not the uh, uh, universal quantifying symbol. Let's get this out of here. V and V is open, then it has to be the case that there will be an open set in the domain such that, first of all, that open set has to include P bar because it's got to be a neighborhood of the reference price list P bar and also that every price list in that neighborhood also has a budget set that intersects this open set. That is, it intersects with the open set and we get a non-empty non set. So let's come back over here and let's notice that, and maybe I'll write this in a little different color, Let's notice that what this actually means here is that there exists some good, one of the indices in the price list or the, the bundle of goods, such that both PI bar is positive and XI circle is positive. There has to be some good that the consumer owns and has some value. So let's draw a diagram over here of the situation where we'll have a counterexample showing why we need this assumption. So here we have the consumption space, or the commodity space, and let's suppose that this is the initial bundle. The consumer owns none of the second good, but does own some of the first good. And let's suppose that the price list here is one in which the first price is zero. So what we have here is that the consumer owns some of the first good, but the price of that good is zero, so that good doesn't provide any value in the sense of the market. The price is zero, and we have the price of the second good is positive, but the consumer doesn't own any of it. So the value of the consumer's initial bundle is zero. It's not positive here. So this is the budget set at P bar is simply the horizontal axis, the X1 axis. And now what happens if we have the price 
increase even a little bit, the price of the first good increases even a little bit here, we're going to have a price list that looks like this and a budget set that looks like this. So this would be our budget set at the new price list. And as you can see, there are plenty of bundles out here on the X1 axis that are in the budget set at P bar that instantaneously disappear from the budget set as soon as the price of the first good becomes positive and the budget set collapses down to the triangle here. And in fact, we can even see that straightforwardly in terms of the definition of lower hemicontinuity by looking at, let's say, some open set V here that, uh, so V is an open set and it's open with respect to or relative to the non-negative quadrant R L2 in the diagram here. And again, that open set V intersects with the budget set at P bar and it intersects with the budget set all along here. There's a lot of points here in the intersection. But again, as soon as the price list has a positive price for the first good so that it's shifted over here, the budget set has collapsed down to this triangle and now all these points that were in the intersection of V and the budget set here, they've all disappeared from the uh, the budget set here and so now the intersection would be would be empty and so this the budget set here is clearly not lower hemicontinuous the definition here isn't satisfied in fact let's uh, let's set this off so we can see a little more clearly what the definition that we're working with is here. And so let's now see if we can give a proof of this theorem. So let's start off, of course, by assuming that the antecedent in our definition is satisfied. So we'll say, let V be an open set such that beta of P intersect V is non-empty. It's exactly what we have for our, for our antecedent. And then we need to prove the consequent. We need to come up with a neighborhood of P bar that such that all the budget sets for all those prices intersect with V. So uh, let's, uh, let's start off by drawing a picture of what we have here. Let's draw a diagram. So let's say this is our uh, budget constraint and let's say this is our initial bundle. So this is X circle and this is the price list P bar. And this is the budget constraint P bar dot X equals uh, P bar dot X circle. And uh, let's note that this then is the budget set for P bar, our kind of reference or benchmark price list. And this should be P bar here also. Uh, and so now let's uh, put in a, a, an open set that intersects with the uh, budget set. So let's say that this is our set V, our open set V. And let's now let's choose some point X bar that's in V and is such that P bar dot X bar is strictly less than P bar dot X circle, which it's actually easy to verify that there is such an X bar. And uh, in the diagram, that would be down here. So let's say that's X bar. So it's pretty clear geometrically that 
uh, if we have an open set intersecting with the budget set, then there's going to be uh, a point that is below, not on, but below the budget constraint and still in the open set V. And so now, why did I want to have uh, a point that's in the intersection and below the budget constraint? So this is a strict inequality here. And the reason is that we want to be able to show that for any price list sufficiently close to P bar, in a neighborhood of P bar, so let's take a price list like this that's close to P bar and the budget constraint associated with that price list. So that's here. And so this is now the budget set for this new price P. And this is the budget constraint for P dot X equals P dot X circle. And so because X bar is below the P bar budget constraint, because this is a strict inequality, I can actually find price lists close to P bar for which X bar will still be in the budget constraint for beta of P. And if X bar were on the budget constraint for P bar, then these prices that are close to P bar like this, we would have budget constraints that don't include the point X bar. So that's the key idea in the proof is to start with a point that's in the open set and is below, strictly below the budget constraint so that nearby prices will still have that point in the budget constraint. So there will be something that's in both a V and the new budget set. And so this intersection will be non-empty. And that's really the structure of the proof. So what do we want to do? Let's, uh, let's uh, define, uh, let's let, let's define the a number which is the difference between the value of X bar and the value of X circle at the benchmark price, price list P bar. And notice that that is, uh, of course, strictly positive because this is strictly negative. P bar dot X bar minus P bar dot X circle. And so now what we want to do is we want to define a delta such that any price list within delta of P bar, so that's going to define our neighborhood U, will satisfy. And so what we're going to do actually is we're going to define the delta in such a way that we will get P dot X bar minus X circle less than P bar dot X bar minus X circle plus C. And since, let's make that a bar here and make that really a circle. <laughs> and so uh, because C is this difference here, this is zero. And so we will have P dot X bar minus P bar, P dot X circle less than zero, exactly what we want. In fact, let's even note that this says P dot X bar is less than P dot X circle, which means that X bar is in the budget constraint for P, and since X bar was also in V, then that means this is in the intersection of the two, and so that means this is non-empty. 
And so that's the proof. So that's the whole proof, but of course we have to actually come up with a delta. And so here's a delta that'll work. Let's let delta be equal to 1 divided by the number of goods, script L, times uh, the distance between x bar and x circle times c. Notice that that's strictly positive because x bar and x circle are not the same vector, not the same bundle, so the distance between them is positive, L is positive, C is positive, so this is positive. So we've got a positive delta. And uh, let's do one other thing, and that is to say that let's use the max norm for, for this, both in the domain and in the target space, because as we've seen before, it's often the case, and it is the case here, you will find, if you try to use the Euclidean norm here, your algebra will be a, a pretty big mess, actually. It can be done, but it's messy. Whereas if you use the max norm, the algebra is pretty straightforward. And so what we'll do is we'll say we've defined our delta here. So now we'll say let P be such that the norm of P minus P bar is less than delta. And then you do some algebra and you get to here. So I will leave you to do the algebra that gets you from here, from here to here that establishes this implication, and you will have completed the proof. And so that's it. That's the proof that the budget set correspondence is indeed lower hemicontinuous. So we have now pretty much established the continuity, both upper and lower hemicontinuity, of the budget set correspondence. That's it for today. See you all next time.